Welcome to A Psych for Sore Minds. I'm very excited about my next guest, Joni Johnson. So she is many things. She's a forensic psychologist, a crime writer, and a private investigator, and also has recently written her own book called Serial Killers, 101 Questions True Crime Fans Ask. And on top of all of that, she has her own YouTube channel. So welcome, Joni. Nice to talk to you. I'm really happy to be here. So let's just go straight into it. My first question would be in, in, you obviously wear lots of different hats and you see lots of different cases from different perspectives. What have been the cases that have stood out to you the most, either because of the nature of the crime or emotional connection to the victim or whatever, whatever connection you felt? Well, there's so many different ways to answer that question. I mean, my first thought was just kind of flashing back to when I was 14 years old and read about Charles Manson and Helter Skelter, because that was really the first kind of true crime case that got me interested in forensic psychology, although I didn't know what it was at the time. And then I've been really lucky enough over the past several years to be interviewed on a number of different shows about serial killers in particular. and. Um, one of the benefits of that, I think, is just getting access to a lot of information that isn't always made public. And so there have been a lot of cases. Um, I'm thinking about Samuel Little, who currently has the most confirmed victims of any serial killer in the United States. That was a really interesting case. And being able to watch hit interviews with him was really interesting. And it really hit home for me what a difficult job it is for investigators who are interrogating somebody because there's this kind of d dance that tends to go on between establishing rapport with this person because you want to get information from this person you want to provide some closure for families and some resolution to law enforcement in this case among 11 different states and so you have to establish rapport and then i think sometimes that involves pretending to almost go along with what this person is saying, which I think yeah. is very uncomfortable for the investigator, but a necessary evil to some extent. And so it's really been interesting to watch some of those interviews and just see how, again, difficult it is for law enforcement. And also, of course, just to see the devastation with families is really a tough thing sure. to witness. Okay. And it, it does certainly seem that you've got an inclination or a special interest in serial killers. Of, of all the different cases that you've seen, what is it do you think that draws you to that particular type of perpetrator or that type of crime? I think that many of us have a fascination, a morbid fascination really with serial killers. I think for a couple of different reasons. One is they so often, particularly when we're talking about male serial killers, they so often target strangers. And I think that many of us can think of a situation in our heads when we really wanted to kill somebody that we knew, you know, we just got so angry at that person or so hurt or felt so betrayed. So it's kind of like we can almost understand that, not, you know, not agree with that or, you know, think it's a good thing. But then to think about somebody just going out and targeting somebody that they don't know and subjecting that person to sometimes just unspeakable horrors is something that I think is frightening. Yeah. And I think it's it's incomprehensible to some extent. And I think also just, you know, the lack of remorse and empathy that you often see is something that is really, it's still after all these years difficult for me to get my head around it. I, you know, I'm often struck by, I will, you know, talk to somebody who maybe was at a bar when, when it, as it turned out later on, the person that they had just met ended up going off with a serial killer. And this person, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later is consumed with guilt. You know, I should have spotted something or this thing seemed kind of off, but I didn't do anything or whatever. And then you have this person who's done all these horrible things who really doesn't seem to leave, you know, to lose a moment's sleep over it. And yeah. I think that's really something that as, as a forensic psychologist, I don't know that we'll ever completely be able to understand that. Yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head. Serial killers are, on the most part, ununderstandable, aren't they? Because other perpetrators of crimes, violence, even extreme violence, even if if the average person wouldn't do what they did, at least you can understand how they got there. You can understand how somebody kills with jealousy or rage. Whereas with serial killers, especially when they pick their victims up at random, it's, it's, it's not really possible to conceptualize why somebody would be driven to do something like that. 
You know, it's so interesting, and I'd, I'd love to hear how things are in the UK, but I know here we would look at, you know, what causes this, that is the number one question, like in my book, what creates a serial killer? It's like we have we have all this information on the one hand, we know about trauma history, which is very common. We know that head injuries occur in a much larger per percentage of serial killers than they do in the population. I mean, we can identify all these kind of risk factors, and yet to say why this person became a serial killer. We don't know that. It's like there's a perfect storm that is created that is a combination of probably some genetic predisposition and then some, you know, childhood history potentially and then some adolescent experiences. But we we don't have a recipe. We can't say if you take A, B, C and D, that's what's going to make a serial killer. I think part of the problem is that the the sample size is so small because serial killers are, are actually very rare, despite the fact that the general public are so scared that it's really hard to, to make any generalizations when you have so few people to, to use as, as a basis or as, as an experiment and because they're all very different as well. So here in the UK, I don't think there's that much of a concerted effort actually to understand serial killers broadly. We take individuals and we look into their into their past and, and we look at all the factors that you mentioned, you know, to, from teenage angst to damaged relationships. So we understand individuals, but I think we have very little understanding of them as a group. Yeah, I think that's true. And, you know, you were talking about how rare it is. And I think that is something that needs to be emphasized because there's so much media attention to it. And in the United States, particular recently, it seems like over the past year, there's really been this just kind of frenzy of shows and documentaries about different serial killers, particularly ones in the you know, 70s, 80s and 90s, which was the heyday of serial killers in the United States. And so I think it's it has created this misperception that there there's there are a lot of them. But you're, one of the things that you mentioned, which I think is really important to point out, is that when we have any kind of situation where it's a rarity, it's so difficult to predict it because it is so rare and it's so difficult to study it um, because it's so rare. Absolutely. So I have to ask, how did you manage to break through into your media career? Because f to be a forensic psychologist, there's, there's a structure, you, know, you can get onto training courses, you can pass exams, whereas the media is a very complicated beast. So how, how did you manage to crack it? Oh gosh, okay. <clears throat> I'm gonna try to give you a relatively short answer because, you know, I've learned to kind of go, well, it was this way and make it seem like it was this like straight line, you know, like, oh, I just had this goal and it just went in reality. It was very like this and this and this. And so when I was a, a practicing therapist or a clean, I'm more of a clinical psychologist, I was on the board of the Mental Health Association living in Dallas at the time. And we were looking to do kind of some public service announcements, announcements around mental health. And somehow, I'm not sure I have the answer to that question, but somehow I got drafted as the person to be on the news with this kind of mental health spot. And I really loved it. And what I loved about it is people would call in the show later and they would say, oh, I didn't know about this, or this was so interesting, or my, this helped my brother, or this helped my sister. And so I really realized I, I, it was really important to me to communicate mental health information to the public. Um, not just to my peers, which is another important group to be collaborating with. So when I moved to San Diego, I really just went to a, lo a local university and said, hey, I did this show. They had a local TV station. It was a university TV station. I'd be happy to host and produce this series about mental health. And so they were like, okay, you'll work for free. <laughs> <I'm> like, yes. <laughs> so, and so I did that and I'd always been doing some forensic work, but about gosh, maybe 20 years ago, I really began specializing in it because it was my interest. I just don't think I knew exactly how to segue into it. Yeah. And I think for a long time, I thought, okay, if you do forensic, you're going to be in court testifying all the time, which is very stressful. I do testify, but it is low on the totem pole of, of satisfaction for me. It's stressful. <laughs> um, and so as I began doing forensic work, I began, um, a friend of mine asked me uh, if I would be interested in writing a column or a blog for psychology today because I would, did do some writing and that kind of stuff. And so I began writing about initially um, just general topics. And then the more I specialized in forensics, then the more I began writing about kind of where law and psychology intersect. And I had always been interested in true crime. I mean, that's like I said, my mom was that way. And, you know, when I was 14, I was reading inappropriate books probably about crime and those kind of things. And so I just 
you know, I began writing this this blog for Psychology Today, and then I, you know, somebody would call me up and say, "Hey, we're doing a show on this," and and that kind of thing. And then I've realized over the years that I think there must be some list somewhere that you know, once you're once you do a couple of interviews, if you do well enough, I guess they kind of go, "Hey, this person." will do it and you know she sometimes can put two sentences together and so i began getting that's kind of how it worked and so it's kind of progressed from there i really enjoy it though i really do because one of the things i'll say is i've found that most of the producers i work with they really are interested in what you have to say it's not like here's a sound bite we want you to say which was a big fear for me at the beginning um and so i i really like that part of it and did you find that you were a natural? So did you, were you nervous the first few times uh, that you did media work, first few times you went on TV or did it come quite naturally to you? I'm nervous every time I go on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I keep thinking at some point I'm not ever going to be nervous being on TV, but I just, you know, I think I'm probably uh, an introvert by nature, even though I, I obviously love doing this. So there's kind of a conflict there, yeah. but I do, I don't get as nervous as I used to. And the other part of it is when you do media stuff, that, that's very comfortable, I think for, for mental health professionals, is it's a conversation. Yeah. It's not like, you know, I mean, there might be a camera there, but you're not really seeing that camera. You're just talking like you and I are talking. And so that really makes it very comfortable. Once the interview starts, I feel pretty comfortable. It's the butterflies leading up to it. There's always that little thing of like, this is the one time I'm really going to blow it. Or, you know, <laughs> what if I don't know what to say or that kind of thing. So I wish I could tell you that Either A, I was never nervous, or B, I was the first two times and now I'm not, but that's not how I work, I guess. <laughs> I think so. I've, I've done bits and pieces of media work, nowhere nowhere to the degree that you have. I've um, done a couple of sound bites for documentaries and been on the radio. And for me, for some reason, I'm, I, I, I do get a little bit nervous beforehand and it's because I convince myself that they want statistics or they want in-depth kind of analysis of complicated and rare psychiatric disorders but actually they don't what they want is is fairly basic if you're you know in the business then it, it's actually quite easy to talk about so I think I overthink it and I think that they want something more complicated than they actually do once you get once you understand that that it's, it's it's not not really a big deal I mean I would think you would just be a natural having watched your you know your show that it would come pretty easily to you which it sounds like it does but there is always that I think when you're um in a certain profession you I think we a lot of times think that, you know, like you were saying, they want something more, a lot more complicated, that the basics, everybody knows the basics. So they're going to be asking these very specific. And really, a lot of times people just want to hear the basics. So they want to hear your opinion about yeah. the basics. So well, they might they might have a broad understanding of the concepts, but they need somebody like us to, to kind of solidify it and explain it in a, in, a, in a simple way to follow. I have to say that giving evidence is probably my favorite part of the job. So I'm curious to know why why uh, you dislike it. You know, I have a really good friend who is a former police officer who is literally, I think he's like a gladiator in a former life. Like he absolutely loves the expert witness stuff and he goes in there and he likes the controversy and the conflict and it's a competitive. And I think, I mean, I, I think what it is, is I'm basically a peacemaker <laughs> at heart. <laughs> I don't want things to be like, everybody to be happy and get along and stuff like that. And so even though I know I never take it personally, I understand that the other side, their job is to, you know, you know, a challenge, which they should. And, or, you know, depending upon who I'm or what, it, you know, t testifying, um, how that works out, you know, um, that one person's job is to try to make me look as good as possible. And the other person's job is probably to make me look as bad as possible. I don't take it personally. I don't think I ever have, but I do think I feel that, you know, uh, that instinct, like I said, that it's, boy, I, I don't like the, the controversy or the conflict. And that's yeah. kind of uncomfortable for me. So it's more probably more of a personality thing than anything else. But it is not the part of, of the forensic uh, psychology role that I enjoy the most, for sure. But I do have friends like you who just get in there and they're like, yeah, <laughs> this is going to be really good. <laughs> the reason I think I enjoy it is because unless you get flustered or unless you let a barrister be the barrister in the uk um make you disagree with yourself or stumble over your words then you're always you always should win the argument i, I know it's not technically an argument but but it's it's 
kind of like a, a pushing of ideas because as a psychiatrist or a psychologist you, you know more about mental health plus you probably had more time to study the individual case and the patient so i think as long as you stick to your guns and don't get tricked then you should always win so i think that's why why i enjoy it because it's, it's like an argument that i know i'm going to win a polite argument but, now in the uk are are the experts hired strictly by the courts or are they depending upon what side so you can either be hired by the the defense solicitors or by the okay. what we call the cps so the crown prosecution service the vast majority of the time it's by the defense uh, because the cps only instruct experts if they disagree with the defense psychiatrist which is okay. only a minority of the time well i i, I don't I don't have an answer for this and, and you might not either, but I do wonder whether, um, how do I put this? Because Americans are known for being quite uh, brash and direct with what they say, whereas English people are always sort of quite shy and reserved. So I wonder whether the actual system's more adversarial in, in the States, the people that are, are, are directly kind of challenging and rude in front of each other, whereas English people kind of want to argue, but we're just too, we're too polite to, to, to really say what we're thinking. Yeah, it would be interesting. Um, you know, I think it, just in my own experience, even in the United States, it just depends so much on if it's a criminal case or a civil case. A lot of times they'll see, I'll see a different degree of enthusiasm in terms of that controversy or that, you know, adversarial nature. And then, you know, I do a lot of work for, um, the board of parole or with public defenders and and um, something that i kind of have a heart for and i like like doing that kind of work and i definitely find that in testifying in those kind of cases as opposed to civil cases when somebody is suing somebody for money and can be, can be very adversarial a lot of times in criminal cases unless it's a super high profile kind of case there doesn't seem to be as much of that there seems to be more almost cohesion because, you know, if there's a relationship between mental illness and violence in this particular person, and it's related to the crime, a lot of times there's a lot of agreement about it, or there's you know, kind of minor disagreement about it. So I don't know, I would be really curious to, to find out, like, as you were saying, if the UK versus the United States, if there was more of a adversarial kind of bent to litigation, I'd be interesting to know. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know either. Do you think this is this is my next question is going to be quite quite a broad one. Do you think that is there anything you can pick up on that you think is flawed in the forensic psychology system in the states or anything that can be done better? Oh gosh. I mean there are so many things I would say about that. I mean, one of the things I really would this kind of I think speaks to I was talking about the adversarial nature of the legal system. I know in some countries, I believe France is one, although I could be mistaken about that, that all the experts are hired by the courts. Right. And I, I kind of respect that system in a way, because even though I, I have to say, I can't think of a time when I've ever felt like my testimony was influenced by the side that's hired me. There is always that push pull and there's always that navigation that you have to, you, you know, you have to be really clear with the person who's, who's hiring you because they're hiring you to give an independent opinion. Yeah. And yet they obviously have a, you know, a, a need to, to protect their client, whether that's the state or the defendant or the, the plaintiff, depending upon civil versus criminal. And so I think that sometimes it gets, um, you know, I think it complicates things. And so I, I understand it because you can get the best person or whatever, if you, you know, if you're using private individuals versus the courts, you probably wouldn't get paid as much if it was all, um, sometimes I think I would prefer that, you know, that kind of, that kind of system. Although, I have never operated in it, so maybe I wouldn't feel that way. Um, yeah, it, does, it does seem a bit more neutral and kind of objective, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, it's, there's a less complications or potential, you know, complications. And then I think, you know, wearing a couple of other different hats that I do, um, I have to say, I think we do as well as we can. There's always, I do a lot of violence risk assessments, and that's so tricky because we know how hard it is to predict future behavior. And yet when somebody is getting out, for parole, that has to be done, you know, it's just, so it's, that's something that I feel like, I don't know that I think our system is as flawed as I think that we just have to keep getting better and working so hard as professionals, as psychologists, 
to try to figure out, you know, how can we do this better? How can we make sure that we are using the right risk factors? And how can we make sure that we are, um, we're including protective factors and those things that sometimes we overlook and that kind of thing. So I, you know, I'm always kind of trying to read and research and worrying and, you know, I don't want to overestimate somebody's violence risk. You don't want to underestimate somebody's violence risk. And how do we put a plan in place also that's going to maximize the chance this person succeeds when they are released? Do you, do you feel similarly or how does that work? Um, yes, I think that what I remember being taught in my training in forensic psychiatry right from the beginning was that we, we, can never predict violence and we should never say that we're predicting violence. Mm -hmm. All we can say is that these factors in this one individual are more likely than the average person to lead to violence. So in some people it might be drug abuse, it might be problematic relationships with specific members of the family, it could be like gang affiliations. So it, it's to highlight the individual factors per person rather than say he's definitely, or he or she is definitely going to do or not going to do this. Mm -hmm. So yeah, violence risk assessment is definitely a big a big part of my um, my day-to-day -day work. I do more expert witness work. So it's more about fitness to plead, um, more about psychiatric defenses. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think the, the, the problem with violence reduction is that you can, you become more confident in predicting somebody's future violence when you know more about them and when they've been through the cycle of forensic psychiatry more times. So there's mm -hmm. a slight irony because you can only, you have more confidence in predicting risk after they've already been through the system, in, in which point it's a bit too late to a degree. It's, a, it's the people who, who are either quite new to the system or who have committed offences quite in a quite an unpredictable manner. So they're not necessarily antisocial and then they suddenly become psychotic out of the blue. Those mm -hmm. are the people that are probably the most dangerous, but also the hardest to uh, to predict violence for. Yeah. It is tricky. You know, one of the things that we're often asked to do here is if somebody is, for example, been in or they are in a forensic hospital and they're wanting to be released in the community. Um, you know, we have to try to make some kind of assessment. You know, obviously we're trying to put together a plan to reduce the risk of violence when they leave, you know, medication mo monitoring. I mean, there's all kinds of possible things. Yeah. But one of the things I think is, is very challenging is, you know, it is different to say this person, these risk factors, um, but they haven't been violent for three years or five years, or they've been in this psychiatric hospital. And then you kind of go, but, but now they're going to be out of a forensic hospital. <laughs> now they're going to be, you know, have all these other things. And so kind of walk in that, you know, I mean, at some point you have to kind of go, we got to give this person a chance, right? I mean, we can't just leave this person definitely, but then you're kind of, this is just something that I think we're always trying to kind of figure out. I think, I think that there's a big section of society, at least, at least here in the UK who have an attitude of like lock, lock them up and throw away the key they mm -hmm. don't understand that well first of all it's a bit it's un inhumane but aside mm -hmm. from that it would clog up the system so you can't have a, a a psychiatric or even a prison system if you don't release people um and you, you do have to take a risk at some point and as you said yourself often that point is when you give them leave or discharge because you can never really know what somebody's thinking mm -hmm. Somebody could be in a hospital for years and they could behave in a certain way through learnt behaviour or even they could genuinely want to contain their risk at that point. But then further down the line, when you eventually discharge them, when they have all these temptations around them, like drugs, for example, things can change and things can escalate, escalate really quickly. And as a forensic psychiatrist or psychologist, you can never know for definite. They mm -hmm. can be settled on the ward for three years without a single incidence of aggression. And then a year down the line after they're kind of outside of your protection and your observation, anything can happen really. So yeah, I know mm -hmm. it's a very risky, risky world. We, we both work in. It is. And, and then all it takes, and I'm, I, don't, I would like, love to hear your experience in the UK, but I feel like so much of the time laws get passed here when something dramatic happens. Yeah. So somebody falls through the system or somebody's probation officer isn't monitoring this person the way they should be monitored or whatever. And then you have this horrific crime that takes place after somebody has been released, which of course that always needs to be evaluated. You know, we want to look back and kind of go, okay, where did, where did things kind of slip through the cracks or whatever? But I don't know that that, that I think that's the best time to then pass legislation, which becomes this kind of huge 
shift in how all individuals with this diagnosis or with this crime or whatever are handled. And then for years later, there's the fallout of that litigation. And, you know, and so and it's reactive. It's not, let's look at the science. Let's look at the statistics. Let's look at the data that we have. It becomes a political issue. That's really interesting that you say that. I think in the UK, as far as I know, instead of legislation changing, we always have more admin and more paperwork. So something goes wrong and then somebody, I presume it's a politician of some kind, it escalates to them and they have a solution. The solution is always more bureaucracy. So it's the risk assessments aren't being done, done thoroughly enough. Therefore, let's make sure that all patients have an extra two risk assessments. Mm -hmm. or for example, uh, leave used to be done on quite an... I mean, it was done, it was analyzed on a formal basis, but the way it was written up was quite informal. You just write it, the doctor would write it up in the notes and that would be it. Uh, whereas I think one or two things happened with forensic psychiatric patients committing violence on leave. And the solution was for the government to have these very formal section 17 forms. Uh, it's just lots of data. So you have to fill in and tick so many more boxes, but it doesn't really, in my opinion, change the risk because the decision process is, is decision making process is still the same and the temptations and the destabilizers in the community are still the same but i think that it looks it's measurable to have more people spending more time on documents so that's what happens it's just it's just more work for the uh, for the clinical team and, I, and i'm i'm doubtful about i'm cynical about whether it's actually helpful or not that's interesting i mean I, there probably is some parallel i'm not i can't think of one right off the top of my head, I mean, what comes to mind for me are laws like the three strikes law, where you have somebody who's committed a couple of crimes and they spend very little time in prison for a number of different reasons. And then a, a horrific crime happens. And then what happens is then it becomes this three strike law where if you have, you know, three felonies, you're in for the rest of your life, which, you know, on the one hand, there are plenty of people who are like, hooray, you know, three strikes, you're out that, you know, in baseball and in the criminal justice system that works. You know? um, but then when practically when you start looking at it it's like you know then it becomes just this huge thing and you have people who are spending years and years and years in prison who are not at any kind of violence risk and you know there, it's arguable whether their offenses should qualify for that anyway and so then the pendulum gradually kind of swings back the other way and that kind of thing and i understand that i mean again anybody who's worked with victims of crime and families with victims of crime and i understand that pain and you know one really really amazing way that i see so many families cope is they they become advocates they become advocates for other victims they become advocates for closing loopholes that should be closed it's just that balance of you know making sure that we're the laws that we're passing and what we're advocating for is really going to be really going to serve the community okay Okay, that makes sense. Um, can I ask you, Joni, for any for any budding forensic psychologists that are, are watching this, have you? What would be? Do you think are the worst and the best aspects of your job? Oh gosh, I love what I do. I mean, I just have to say that I absolutely love it. Um, I'm old enough. I know I don't look it. Oh, <laughs> but I, I'm old enough where it's. I feel like a lot of the advice I would give would be like, uh, okay, well that was true 30 years ago, but now it's not. Um, so the best parts of my job is it's, it's endlessly flexible. I mean, there are so many things, and I know you can attest to this. There's so many hats you can wear as a forensic psychologist. I mean, you can work in the court system. You can work for the board of parole. You can work in a prison. You can work in a hospital. You can work in a corporate America. I mean, you can. there's a lot of different things that you can do as a forensic psychologist. And that's one of the things I really, really love about it. Um, worst thing about being a forensic psychologist, I think that totally depends upon your setting that you're in. I worked in a prison, a maximum security prison for a couple of years on the crisis unit and I loved it. However, it was so stressful. I mean, it was just incredibly intense. And one of the most challenging parts of that for me was I had younger kids at the time that, you know, people just don't become like not suicidal when it's five o'clock. And so I would go to work and your shift might be eight to four or nine to five or whatever. And I would be there till eight o'clock at night sometimes because you just have to kind of take care of that. So that's again, more of a specific position drawback. Um, as if I, like I said, I, I can't think of anything else I would rather be doing. And so I don't want to paint this Pollyanna picture of 
everybody should be a forensic psychologist. But for me, um, looking at being able to talk about and evaluate and, and, and talk to people and look at where law and psychology kind of intersect is the most interesting thing in the world to me. So I would not change it for anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's a uh, glowing recommendation from you there. Um, in terms of patients that you've seen, are there any, either any individuals or, and feel free to anonymize them, or an individual setting where you found them more challenging than others? So for example, if they've been aggressive or violent, uh, is there any, any, anything that stands out for you? Probably, you know, obviously working in um, a prison setting was probably the most challenging in terms of of that piece of it. Now, I do think being a psychologist or being a mental health professional, um, I was, I, I always felt safe for the most part working in a prison. I don't think I was naive and although it's, it was funny because there was this constant tension between custody officers and mental health professionals. Cause I think custody officers who saw everything that we did not see, you know, thought we were like little snowflakes walking around, you know, we had this Pollyanna view of, and I don't think that's true to a large extent. I mean, I think what that was really reflecting is that, think about it, you know, if you're a psychologist working where I used to work, you are very low on the hit list. I mean, it's going to be number one, a fellow inmate, right, who is likely to be the target of violence. Number two, probably a custody officer that you've gotten in some kind of beef with. Number three, a psychiatrist <laughs> who may be trying to get you to take medication that you don't want to take or right. that, you know, I mean, you know, psychologists for the most part were seen as kind of the helpers, right? These are the people who um, can help me, can help me maybe get changed to a different yard, um, can help me if I'm depressed or thinking about suicide, um, sometimes can help me um, by, you know, if I have a drug debt that I can't pay, I can pretend to be suicidal and get changed to a different yard. I mean, there's all that kind of complexity. So, but it was, there were very, definitely some challenging, challenging parts um, just working in that system and just also trying to manage and navigate the relationships among the different inmates was probably one of the most challenging, I think, parts of that, because that's where things really can be unpredictable. And, and it took me a while to understand kind of the, the yard politics, which are very real as I don't know if you've worked in a prison setting, but it's you have, you have to know those. I mean, you, you have to figure those out pretty quickly. Um, so I think that was really challenging. And also just, you know, even though you know that by the fact that you have been sentenced to prison, you were giving up some of your rights. It was always hard for me just because there's such a lack of confidentiality and trying to maneuver that was something that was re really stressful for me. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I have, I, I carry out one-off assessments in male prisons quite frequently, probably about okay. two or three months. And I, I did work in a female prison for about two years. Okay. And people often would ask me about whether I felt safe or not. Mm -hmm. And actually I did feel safe on the whole, um, mm -hmm. similar to your experience. I think because when I do the medical legal assessments, the vast majority of the time they're on their best behavior because mm -hmm. they think partially correctly that if they make a really good impression that I would write a positive report for them and the judge might be lenient on their sentencing. Um, so they're generally on their, on their best behavior. The exception to that, I think, are the ones who are completely floridly psychotic and they, they literally can't contain their behavior or they don't, they don't understand what's going on. And generally speaking, they tend to be on, on officer on lock. So you have prison officers with them or, or you have to see them like through the hatchet in the door because they're so dangerous. Mm -hmm. So. So for those reasons, generally, I've, I've felt quite safe. And I think women's prisons are, are slightly different because there is there is a, a degree of, of violence and aggression, but it's a lot less. I think I think there's a there's a bigger, bigger feeling of camaraderie and everyone helping each other. Whereas mm -hmm. in men's prisons, especially in the States, from what I hear, there's a, there's a lot of gang culture and, and um, division, I'd say. Um, OK, so one thing that you mentioned before is about prisoners who might try it on a little bit. So, for example, they might exaggerate suicidality because because they want something from you. Is that something that you experience quite a lot? Do you think do you think do you see defendants and inmates who who are, who are exaggerating or malingering for their own gain? I don't I can't say I saw it a lot. 
you know, I think it's it was really interesting because first of all, just by my job, I'm only seeing inmates who have been who are in the mental health system inside prison. And it's I think it's easy for, you know, people that I talk to on a regular basis, there seems to be, I think, this assumption that if you're in prison, you have some mental health problem. Or you know, it's kind of like the it's kind of like the thing that if you're violent, you've got to be crazy, which we know is not true. I think so. I think about 35% of inmates in the United States in the prison population have are receiving or have received some kind of mental health care in the system. And that can range from we see you every couple of months to check in because you have a history of depression at some point in your life, all the way to being sent to a forensic hospital where you're, you know, you're, where you're there um, until you're ready to be released. So there's a huge, you know, variability. So I'm not seeing most inmates, first of all. And then number two, I think most of the inmates that I saw were experiencing significant mental health problems, especially on the crisis unit, which is where I was at the same time. Um, if you are an inmate, you have to learn to f figure out how to navigate that system. And that means surviving. And so I definitely did see um, on more than one occasion, somebody who, you know, claimed to be suicidal. And I think they were afraid is really what they were because they, again, whatever reason they, they got in a conflict with another gang member or they again had a drug debt that they weren't able to pay there was some kind of problem on the yard and so you know a lot of, sometimes i think that person felt like if i go to the custody officer and tell tell them what's really going on then i'm either going to be disciplined because i'm not supposed to be doing these things anyway yeah. or i'm, I'm going to be kind of told well too bad it's your problem you now whether that's true or not that was the perception of it yeah. and so you know claiming to be a suicidal or having a mental health crisis was one way to get removed from that yard you know and either put in the crisis unit or sometimes they would get put in the segregation unit for safety concerns so you're not being punished necessarily but you're being put in the segregation unit until we figure out what we you know what we do with you so yeah i definitely saw that but no i don't i I didn't, I would not say that that is something that happens, you know, often, yeah. but it, you know, it, I, I, there's actually, I can't even remember, there's a slang term that people used to use for it, um, for this kind of like suicidality that was kind of you know, a code word for, I got to get off this yard, you know, before something really bad happens. So yeah, it was, you know, a very small minority, but again, it happened often enough that everybody kind of knew about it. And, and sometimes, a lot of times the inmates, once they were on, once they were safe, right off that yard, they would say what was going on. You know, they'd, they'd kind of be like, you know, I can't go back here. And, and th we're not, you know, nobody's going to send that somebody back to a yard where they could get, you know, get hurt. So it was a pretty, in some respects, a pretty adaptive way of dealing with a situation. Yeah. No, I can, I can totally understand you, you, you adapt to your environment, don't you? So if they felt that was the only, only way to get out of their situation, it makes sense. Mm hmm um, so if, if I can ask you, you I, I know that you were a private investigator. Do you still do that kind of work now? You know, the, the short answer is no. I mean, I became a private investigator. I used to do years ago um, a lot of assessments and investigations in companies uh, where somebody was complaining harassment or discrimination. I partnered with a labor law attorney for a few years in Dallas and would go in and do this. And then when I moved to California, I did this for a while. And, and it was interesting kind of work, very different from obviously from most of the forensic work that I do. And then California passed a law that you had to be a private investigator. You had to be, I'm sorry, you had to either be a private investigator or an attorney to right. do any kind of workplace investigation. Okay. Um, and so I decided, oh, okay, well, you know, I have a big birthday coming up. I'm going to become a private investigator <laughs> for my birthday. And so I had done so many investigations. Normally you had to have two years of experience under a private investigator to be eligible to sit for the license. But I had done so many workplace investigations already. They waived that, that two years. And so I took the test and, and passed it and became a private investigator. And I've renewed my license ever since then. I don't do that many workplace investigations anymore. I really like this criminal work is kind of where my heart is. Yeah. And I've never done the kind of work a lot of people associate with though. Like I'm not 
with a camera, you know, staking out the husband leaving his office to see if he's driving to the hotel or anything like that. I've never done that kind of a work. And I don't think that would be my bailiwick at all. So yeah, it was really for this very specific purpose. It allowed me to continue to do these investigations. And then, you know, I think I've, you know, it's probably vanity to some extent. It's kind of like, I don't want to give it up, right? I mean, I passed the test, I kind of think so. I just keep renewing my license, even though I don't do that many anymore. I'm amazed that you managed to fit all of this in because you have so many different perspectives and so many different kind of areas that you work in. Well, thank you. I mean, I'll take that as a compliment, although I could also say it could probably some maybe latent undiagnosed ADD going on as well. I'll write your I prescription. Really I, th I like so many different aspects of, of forensic work. I really do. I mean, it's only been in the past 10 years I've realized that I can't do everything. I mean, I just can't do everything. And so I really like the criminal aspect and I like the competency to stand trial or the fitness to plead evaluations that you do. I, I like the criminal responsibility or the insanity pleas. I like working with the board of parole and evaluate. That's really where I do most of my work now. But it's great having that background, having been able to do a bunch of different kinds, I think. And despite everything that you do, you've managed to somehow find time to write a book. So it's called Serial Killers, 101 Questions True Crime Fans Ask. Can you tell us a bit about that, please? Can you tell us what inspired you and the process of researching it as well? That really was a gift of the, pan of the pandemic to some extent. It really did kind of free up my time. And I mentioned this blog that I write for Psychology Today, which has been, gosh, it's been, I think, 2009 when I first started um, doing that blog. And I just have had this amazing group of readers who have kind of followed over the years. And I would get all these questions. I mean, I'm always getting questions. What about this? What about this? What about this? And so, and, and some of them I felt like I could answer and some of them I didn't. I mean, it was like, I'm not sure that that's such an interesting question. Um, and so a couple of years ago, I just started writing down questions that people would ask me about serial killers. Cause that's, again, people are so fascinated by that. Mm. I would get a lot of questions and I do write about different cases. And so they read, read an article and say, what about this? Or, you know, what causes a serial killer? Or are there any female serial killers or blah, blah, blah. And so again, I thought, well, I want to know the answer to these questions. And so when the kind of pandemic started, or I, I, start, I thought, you know, I'm going to really write this book in a way, just for my readers, just to say, okay, these are all the questions that I've gotten. And of course I added some myself just to, because, I, you know, I don't know everything about serial killers. I don't know that anybody does, but I, I don't. And I, so I'm like, I'm going to find out what I can. And so this book came about as a result of that. I began looking, you know, writing all these questions down and then answered the ones that I knew the answers to. And just based on my research and um, over the years, and then kind of set about trying to answer the ones I didn't know. And how do you do that? How do you find such, uh, such niche exclusive information about serial killers and it was all over the place i mean there are some journals that have written about case studies about serial killers there are some you know we don't have enough research because they're relatively rare um i found out about serial kill some serial killers just from looking at um international papers i mean that's one of the things i feel like in the united states that we a lot of times don't pay attention to the rest of the world, you know, I mean, as much as I think we should in terms of, you know, and so I was kind of like, gosh, you know, one question that I had for myself was, does the culture in which a person lives, in which they're kind of brought up, would that impact a serial killer? I mean, would it impact in terms of their victims? Would it impact in terms of the way that they operate? I'm kind of curious about that. So I really tried to research serial killers in all these different countries and look and see, what am I seeing here? And I did find that yeah i mean it's really fascinating that i don't think that a, a country or a culture creates a serial killer but i think it can influence the victims that they choose i mean i came across a serial killer in one country who had murdered a hundred children and most of the children had never been reported missing and it's like well that's because there's some very specific cultural reasons for that that you know there's a lot of poverty in this in this culture um there's a lot of street children there's not as much reporting there's a sense that the police don't care as much about these children whereas in some countries you're going to see that if you're looking for a vulnerable population you might you know pick sex workers 
for example. So I was just really interesting. So I looked in a lot of different places to try to find this information. And then some of them were not that difficult. I mean, one question, um, you know, that one reader had was, who is the youngest serial killer? I mean, I was kind of like, who is the youngest serial killer? I got to find out who this is. Um, because that's not something that I would come across necessarily in my research or expert witness stuff or interviews or anything like that. And, you know, I found out there was an eight year old little boy from India who had killed three, at least three children when he was eight. And it was like, so then of course, I, and that was probably the most fun for me. I would go down this whole bunny hole of right, you know, rabbit hole of like, then I wanted to know, like, well, what happened to him? And, you know, <laughs> how did this person get captured? And, you know, and what did they do with this person? And where is this person now? And, and a lot of times it's just a matter of tracking down. I mean, we are so lucky these days in terms of the internet and all the information we can find out about, you know, individuals in, you know, like in different countries, just from reading all these different articles and following the trail. So a variety of sources that I used. Wow, an eight-year-old. That blows my mind. <laughs> yeah, it blew my mind as well. It did. Um, that's really helpful, Jenny. So my last question to you, can you please tell our viewers a bit about your YouTube channel? My YouTube channel is called Unmasking a Murder, and it is... I guess a true crime YouTube channel, I try to take a case and talk about the case specifics in the beginning and then more toward the end of it, try to talk about it from a psycho, you know, psychology point of view. Um, and it's, I really, really enjoy that. There are so many amazing YouTube channels out there that talk about true crime. And one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do with mine is to, you know, make sure I'm staying true to my profession and talking not just about the case, but also about the psychology behind that. Sure. And so unlike you who are incredibly disciplined and are very regular in getting your episodes out, that is something that I am continuing to struggle with in terms of time management, but I love it. I really, really enjoy it. And, um, you know, the, the people who, who watch it and comment on it are just, they, at least to date, I'm, I'm sure not everybody loves it, but I've just gotten such support and positive feedback I've been pretty overwhelmed by that. So it's something that I'm hoping to move further up in terms of priorities, but I really, really enjoy it. And I can, I can, I can vouch for your channel journey. Um, I've watched several episodes and uh, found it really entertaining, really interesting. And like you say, your USP is that you're actually psychologically breaking people down. So you're not just recycling information that's out there. You're giving your own personal view, so. Well, thank you. Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for appearing as a guest. And I loved it. It was so much fun. It really was. Let's stay in touch. And I would encourage all my viewers to go and check out your book and your YouTube channel as well. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. All the best. Same here. Bye.